high above the earth, slowly rotating through the silent voids of space, is the Arthur C. Clarke Astronomical Observatory, Star Lab. Here, the International Space Authority, ISA, watches over an eternity of uncharted galaxies and the countless planets orbiting within their starlit borders. For six days and nights, two drone laboratory pods, the Osiris and the Anubis, have been floating in a safety orbit 1,500 kilometers beyond Star Lab. Aboard the Anubis, physicist Paul Kramer is completing a dangerous hydrogen plasma experiment. 200 meters away aboard the Osiris, Star Lab research director Maura Cassidy is monitoring the experiment's data and relaying it to the Mycroft computer aboard Star Lab. It is July 19, 2026, 0815 Universal Interstellar Time, as this week's adventure, The Keeper of Eight, takes us from the routine of a deep space laboratory experiment into the mysterious light and shadow of alien worlds. Paul, check the plasma chamber seals again. I'm still getting a red light on number four. I read triple zero across the board, Maura. There must be an indicator malfunction on your end. Let's cross-check it. Osiris to Star Lab. You there, Valerie? Valerie? <laughs> oh, Dr. Reed, good morning. Oh, <laughs> sorry, Mara. You caught me with a mouthful of toast. Mm. Anyway, Paul's right. My crop also reads triple zero. Oh, you mean I've got a short circuit? Oh, how embarrassing. Well, do you think you could stop blushing long enough to spacewalk on over here? Just as soon as I get my helmet on. Why, what's the problem? The valence analyzer I brought up from Tara was a gift from the Institute. And I sure don't want to leave it behind. Maura, I'm going to need your help taking it apart so we can get through the airlock. Okay, shoot the umbilical over and I'll show you why I almost ran away with the circus to be a tightrope walker. Here it comes. Umbilical secure. I'm on my way. Depressurizing her airlock, Mora swings open the hatch and floats from the zero gravity interior of the Osiris into the starlit vacuum of deep space. Her tinted glass helmet and metallic yellow pressure suit glittering in the clean white light of the sun. Oh, oh, can you see me? <laughs> I sure can, loud and clear. What's so funny? <laughs> You're upside down. Uh, wait a minute, Mora. I'm reading a ship in the area, 057 and closing. Do you see it? Hold on. Let me get turned around. Oh, yeah. Yes, I see it. It's black. There aren't any markings. It's... It's called it shaped like a bat. Tremendous wingspan. It, it's moving into a parking orbit directly above us. Something's coiling out of one of those nose bends. Looks like a metallic black snake. Oh, oh it's moving forward. <laughs> Stargazer security station, Captains John Graydon and Buddy Griff, unaware of what has happened at Vector 448, inspect the new ISA deep space interceptor, Solaris. Four Alpha sunburst engines, primary and secondary energy absorbent field generators, high density particle deflectors. Hey, this baby's really loaded. Yeah, hard beam photon shielding, five dual laser turrets and a modified Starsmith Parsec Accelerator. Now tell me, buddy, what more could you ask for in a ship? Uh, how about a Michelle and a Mitzi? A what? A Michelle and a Mitzi. 
Is that some kind of top secret equipment I haven't heard about? Uh, not exactly, Skipper. Uh, Michelle and Mitzi are those two terrific looking inspectors standing over there. Oh. And from where I stand, their equipment is anything but secret. Uh, buddy, just between you and me, have you ever been accused of having sexist leanings? Uh, let me put it this way, Skipper. Attention all paramedic search vessels. This is an emergency rescue alert. Pilots and crews report to the information office in your sector. Captains Graydon and Griff, please contact the bridge. Come on, buddy. Let's use the radio aboard the Solaris. Right. Solaris to bridge. This is Captain Graydon. I have some bad news, John. The Anubis laboratory pod exploded five minutes ago. Dr. Kramer was inside. Exploded? Dr. Kramer. What about the Osiris? What about Dr. Cassidy? Is she all right? We don't know, John. She was EVA when the Anubis blew up. Well, for God's sake, what happened? We don't know that either, buddy. They finished their experiment, and Star Lab was about to launch a shuttle to pick them up when an unidentified ship came into the area. 30 seconds later, the Anubis exploded. All right, feed the coordinates into the Solaris onboard computer. We're going out there. Roger. Mora. Not Mora. Shocked by the tragedy of the Anubis laboratory pod explosion and fearing for the life of Dr. Mora Cassidy, John and Buddy prepare to launch the Solaris into deep space vector 448. Unaware that this is only the first step on a journey that will soon bring them into contact with not one, but two alien worlds. The Anubis and the Osiris float in a safety orbit beyond Star Lab. Aboard the Anubis, Dr. Paul Kramer has just completed a dangerous hydrogen plasma experiment. Dr. Mora Cassidy has left the Osiris and is spacewalking between the two pods. Suddenly, an eerie, bat-shaped vessel appears from the dark vacuum of space and lashes out at the Anubis with a gleaming metallic black tongue. The Anubis erupts in a fury of twisting light and shattered metal. Dr. Kramer is killed instantly. Mara vanishes. The Osiris is carried away by the shock wave of the explosion. John Graydon and Buddy Griff streak toward the area aboard the Solaris, followed by stargazer rescue ships. Meanwhile, the mysterious bat-wing alien vessel moves into a parking orbit behind the moon. What quantity of hydrogen plasma was withdrawn from the Earth probe by our penetrator before the explosion? 2,000 fusion cubits. Mm. Enough to fill the planet generators of every ship in the Armada. Enough for every shadow sentry, light assassin, scan watcher, and penetrator guide who wears the dark armor of Draconia. I wonder what the humanoid was doing with so vast a quantity of concentrated hydrogen. No matter. Mask, convey my compliments to the scan watcher who detected the pod and to the penetrator guide who withdrew the hydrogen with such unusual skill. I accept your thanks on their behalf, my lord. Mask. Has there been any sign of the Keeper? Not since we entered this galaxy. Perhaps we've slipped away from him. Don't fool yourself, Mask. He's clever. Extremely clever. He'll find us, eventually. And when he does, he'll do everything in his power to prevent us from reaching the hydrogen fields of Terra. How much time will you need to assemble the Armada? It can be done within four solar days. Then do it. Yes, my lord. Where are you, Keeper? In this galaxy? On Terra? Or perhaps...
that you're down there on the dark side of the moon. As Mosk prepares to assemble the draconian armada for an assault on Terra, and Warp fantasizes about a mysterious pursuer known only as the Keeper, John and Buddy enter Vector 448 aboard the Solaris and begin their desperate search for Mora Cassidy. Buddy, what's that on screen six? Take it easy, Skipper. Let's magnify it and have a look. It's the plasma chamber from the Anubis. Damn it. Wait, something's not quite right here, Skipper. What do you mean? The chamber's still intact. If the hydrogen plasma didn't explode, what did? I'll tell you what. I'll stay here and watch the lifeform scanner screen. You get down to the recovery bay and take the chamber aboard with the grapplers. We'll turn it over to the spectrograph on Star Lab. They can analyze it. Maybe they can tell us what happened. That's good. John, about Mora. She's alive until we prove otherwise, okay? Of course. I'll talk to you from recovery. Star Lab to Solaris. Solaris, go ahead, Star Lab. John, it's Valerie. Anything? We found the plasma chamber from the Anubis. It's completely intact, isn't it? Yes, it is. How did you know? Then what caused the explosion? Get down here. What is it, buddy? The plasma chamber. There's a hole in it about the size of my fist. And so help me God, I can hear someone breathing. Buddy, Skipper, grab that other pulse wrench off the wall. We've got to get this thing open. Where's the hole? There on the other side. Listen. Come on, Skipper, come on. Watch out, buddy. Mora! Take your feet, buddy. Easy. Skipper, the whole left side of her helmet is split open. Mora. Mora, can you hear me? Get her gloves off and check her fingernails. They're normal, Skipper. No sign of anoxia. Her lips are normal, too. Let's get her out of the suit. Right. I'm blinding. Take it easy, Mora. You're safe now. Go oh, safe. I'm safe inside now. Buddy, hasn't it hit you yet? Oh. What? We just took Mora out of a one-ton plasma chamber, hermetically sealed from the outside, with no way in except through a six-inch hole. Now, how in the name of God did she get in there? Sure, she's all right. Positive. The body scan John had on her in the medical chamber showed that everything was perfectly normal. Well, Dr. Rossiter wants to examine her anyway, so take her directly to sick bay when you dock. Roger, Starlet. Solaris out. I know what Dr. Rossiter said, Mora, but I think you should take it easy for a day or two. <laughs> John, I feel fine. You better get some rope, Skip. Looks like we're going to have to tie her down. Hi, Mara. How you feeling? Oh, Valerie. Am I ever glad to see you. What have you got there, Valerie? Your report. Um, I'd like to go over it with you. Come on, buddy. We've got work to do. We'll be down in Docking Bay 4 if you need us, Mara. All right. See you later. You look more serious than usual, Valerie. What's on your mind? How you got inside the plasma chamber. I've worn every circuit in Mycroft to a frazzle trying to figure it out. Have you tried the Houdini file? The Houdini file? Uh, it's a joke, Valerie. Oh, sorry, Mara. 
<laughs> My sense of humor escaped me there for a minute. Oh, yes. Well, uh, maybe we can get a volunteer from the audience to help you find it. Mm. <laughs> Hi, Dr. Cassidy. Is uh, Dr. Reed with you? Oh, yes, yes, I'm here somewhere. The Mycroft's printing out the results of your molecular transposition program. Oh, I'll be right there. Be back in a few minutes, Mara. Mm -hmm. Maybe Mycroft's finally come up with something. I hope so. What on earth? What on earth? No more and no less than on any other planet, Laura. I know your voice. Where are you? Sometimes I'm here, sometimes I'm there. I'm here, there, and everywhere. Who are you? My father was infinity. My mother was the light. I am Echo, the keeper of everything. Translucent fragments of cool white light materialize in Mars quarters and slowly puzzle together to form a calm shimmering pool of ethereal radiance free floating in the center of the room. From within the pool, the timeless voice of Echo, the keeper of eight, the guardian of infinity, a pure energy being from the elsewhen and elsewhere of alien worlds. Alien Worlds continues. A mysterious alien vampire ship has destroyed the laboratory pod Anubis, killing physicist Paul Kramer. Floating in space near the Anubis, at the moment of its destruction, Mora somehow escapes death and is found by Buddy and John, sealed inside a plasma chamber from the Anubis. Her presence there, a logical impossibility. Now, after being taken back to Starlab, Alone in her quarters, Mora suddenly finds herself in the presence of Echo, the Keeper of Eight, a free energy being who has suddenly manifested in the form of a radiant pool of floating light. I am the last of an ancient race of star watchers, a refugee from a parallel universe, destroyed in the subvoid annihilations that created the star system. A parallel universe? You mean there used to be more than one? There still are, Mara. Hundreds of them. Beyond the time-space continuum of this one. What are they like? You know that as well as I do. I don't understand. <laughs> you dream, don't you? Yes, I dream. And when you do, you pass from the illusion of one universe into the illusion of another. And then another. And then another. Each is a reflection of the other. Endlessly echoing through the antediluvian corridors of infinity. What happened during the explosion? Molecular dematerialization of what might have been the moment of your death. While the Anubis was still disintegrating, I transformed you into pure energy and rematerialized you inside the plasma chamber. If I hadn't, you would have been killed by the shrapnel debris of the exploding pod. But my helmet was split open. It was struck by a pod fragment an instant before I dematerialized you. I sealed it with thought until the chamber was taken aboard the Solaris. You're lucky I happened to be in the neighborhood. Yes, lucky. I don't know what to say. I... Thank you, Echo. I... Oh, God, thank you. The vampire ship that killed Dr. Kramer is part of an armada from the Draconian system. They're preparing for an assault on the hydrogen fields of Terra. Hydrogen fields? On Terra? The Draconians are hydrogen gill breathers. Even their economy is hydrogen-based. They trade among themselves like currency. But, like any system that bases its economy on a single element, there are power struggles, greed, waste. The hydrogen vaults of Draconia are nearly empty. And the civil war is raging throughout their system for control of what remains. They need vast amounts of hydrogen to restabilize themselves. And they intend to take it from the Earth's oceans. Then Paul's death was an accident, wasn't it? Yes. When they penetrated the hydrogen plasma chamber, they punctured the pod's retrofuel tanks. 
That's what caused the explosion. Pure oxygen is one of the most explosive gases in the universe. The Earth would be saturated with it if they removed the hydrogen from our oceans. Echo, how can we stop them? Where's the Armada? What are their weaknesses? I have to leave you now, Mara. Uh, Echo! Come back, Echo! 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 Echo? He called himself Echo? Are you absolutely certain you weren't having some kind of delayed stress reaction? John, you know me better than that. And I know me better than that. I believe you, Maura. I just wanted to be sure that you believed you. It all fits, Skipper. The problem now is how to deal with the Draconians. We don't even know where they are. I don't think that Draconian ship is very far away. Oh, Valerie, I forgot you were listening. Why? What makes you say that? The element scanners are reading a first magnitude concentration of hydrogen somewhere behind the moon. Hmm. That might be it. Well, there's only one way to find out. Maura, do you feel up to a little ride in the Solaris? Hmm, I certainly do. I'll meet you in the launch bay after I talk to Commissioner White. Hey, what about me? I don't know, Valerie. It could be dangerous. Danger is my middle name. Oh, I thought Daphne was your middle name. Oh, Mara. <laughs> okay, you can come along. Meet me in the communications center. Mara, is her middle name really Daphne? I was just kidding, buddy. Her middle name really is Danger. <laughs> As Mara hurries toward the communications center, John and Buddy enter a pneumatic lift and descend to the launch bay complex, located in Star Lab's huge central hub. Meanwhile, a quarter of a million miles away, the draconian vampire ship continues to drift in a parking orbit, 1,000 kilometers above the dark side of the moon. Permission, my lord? Yes, of course, Musk. My time is yours. The Armada will enter this star system two solar days hence. It will consist of 200 multi-atmosphere assault cruisers, a flight of 1,800 siege raiders, 600 defense penetrators, and 1,000 armed tankers. 1,000 tankers. Excellent. That's twice the number I expected. How did you manage it, Musk? A bribe, my lord. 9,000 fusion cubits of hydrogen to the magistrate of the opposition alliance. Economic seduction. Still the broadest and most effective avenue to conquest, especially during a civil war. 9,000 fusion cubits. A small price to pay for 500 tankers the magistrate will never see again. My assumption is correct, isn't it, Moss? Yes, my lord. Our shadow sentries boarded the opposition tankers and neutralized the crews as the armada was passing through the twilight meridian. Of course, the twilight meridian. Are you two strapped in back there? Anytime you're ready, John. All set. Okay, buddy. Let's do it. Synchronize all computer functions. We have a positive decoder interlock on all data terminals. Manual launch functions are canceled. Real-time status is 20 seconds to ignition and counting. Buddy, you know we don't know what the Draconians are going to do when they see us. So as soon as we get a fix on their ship, lock in our photon shielding and energy-absorbent field generators and activate all laser turrets. Okay, Skipper. Come on, Solaris. Let's go! Behind the moon, a draconian command ship floats in orbit, waiting for the armada it will lead in a vampire assault against the hydrogen-rich oceans of the Earth. Aboard the Solaris, Buddy, John, Mora, and Dr. Valerie Reed, jetting toward the moon to investigate the bat-winged alien vessel from what they hope will be a safe distance. And somewhere in the starlit spaces between the two ships, Echo, the Keeper of Eight, a pure energy being from a lost parallel universe, an intelligence whose power and wisdom is destined to become the Earth's sole defense in the coming struggle with the darker forces of alien worlds.
The Keeper of Eight was based on a story by Skip Press and written by Ron Thompson. Associate producer, Jeff Allen. Music director, Tom Rounds. Engineer, Stu Jacobs. Assistant to the producer, Laurie Tyler. Technical consultant, Peter Skye. Alien Worlds was created, produced, and directed by Lee Hansen and distributed by Watermark Incorporated. And so, until next time, this is Roger Dressler inviting you to join us for the conclusion of The Keeper of Eight on Alien Worlds.